Hello, I'm Carl Herzog, public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. On the morning of December 29, 1812, USS Constitution, under the command of William Bainbridge, was cruising off the coast of Brazil when they spotted two ships and made chase. One ship turned back toward the coast, but the other began moving to intercept Constitution. Within a couple hours, Constitution realized they were about to head into battle against HMS Java, a 38-gun frigate that had been seized by the British from the French earlier. The ensuing battle with Java would turn out to be a choreography of maneuvering that demonstrates some of the difficulties of battle in the Age of Sail. Unlike Constitution's first victory against HMS Guerriere, the battle against HMS Java was fraught with a lot of delicate maneuvering that was made even more difficult by damage done to Constitution very early in the battle. But in the end, Bainbridge and Constitution were successful in defeating Java thanks to a number of factors that came together for Constitution. In part, it was the teamwork and the ability of the ship's crew to continue steering and operating the ship without the wheel. And additionally, Bainbridge's decision to set some additional sails to improve their ability to maneuver against Java made a huge difference. But in the end, their ability also to take down one of Java's masts, rendering her unable to maneuver anywhere near as effectively as Constitution, sealed the end of the battle and caused the surrender of Java. By the time it was all over, Java was so badly damaged that the ship had to be scuttled and couldn't even be kept as a prize. To explore some of the choreography of maneuvering that went into this battle and take a step-by-step -step look at it, Today I thought we would break out some small miniature ships on my dining room table and see if we can see how this battle unfolded. There are a couple resources available on the USS Constitution Museum website that can help you make sense of the step-by-step -step process that this battle unfolded with. Through the Discover and Learn page on the USS Constitution Museum's website, you can connect to a series of maps that guide you through each of Constitution's major War of 1812 cruises and her major victories over British ships. The second one, A Second Victory, covers the battle with HMS Java and provides a step-by-step -step, uh, description of the entire cruise under William Bainbridge, showing maps that guide you along the exact location of the places that all of it took place. Through the links to our Explore the Collection page, you can find an entire section of information about the battle with HMS Java, as well as information about the commander at the time, William Bainbridge. Under our section on the battle with HMS Java, one of the objects in our collection that is particularly helpful in understanding the battle is a diagram of the battle that shows the step-by-step -step maneuvers that they engaged in. These dance diagrams, as we like to call them, are really helpful in understanding the battle and were often drawn by members of the crew immediately after battles. They often, however, are slightly out of scale and don't really provide an accurate sense of the distances at which the ships were maneuvering or the overall distances that they were traveling, traveling over the course of the battle. Feel free to take a look at these either as you watch this video or you can download and follow them along later. In addition, the entire logbook for a transcript of the entire logbook of Constitution's Cruises is available for download from that Explore the Voyage page. We'll be using the logbook transcript to talk through some of the step-by-steps as described by Bainbridge uh, in the log after the battle. So let's go to the dining room table and see what this looked like. After first sighting the two ships in the morning around 9 a.m., it took several hours for Constitution to both get in range of Java and to identify her as a British frigate. It was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon by the time they came in range and the first broadsides began firing. Constitution began by firing canister and grape shot, and Bainbridge was frustrated that he couldn't get within closer range. But at this beginning point, Java had what was known as the weather gauge. They were the upwind ship, and for Constitution to make its way closer upwind to Java would have meant att attempting to tack against the wind, 
which would have exposed the ship to raking and made it much more difficult and slow to get any closer. Instead, the two ships began wearing, turning their stern through the eye of the wind in an attempt to get position to rake each other while avoid being raked at the same time. It's after this first early wear that a broadside from Java takes out uh, USS Constitution's wheel uh, and killing the crew members who were serving at that wheel. As a result, through the rest of the battle, Constitution had to be steered directly by block and tackle attached to the tiller, two decks below the upper spar deck. During this first rig, Java came so close to Constitution that the ship's bowstrip tangled up in Constitution's mizzen rigging, forcing Java to bear off while Constitution, suffering from the damage of the lost wheel, continued to sail forward. Moments later, as they came abreast again, Java's foremast collapsed. Without that forward mast, Java rounded up into the wind while Constitution bore away. It's at this point that William Bainbridge made a, a pivotal decision to set more sail, sails that normally would not be set during battle, in an effort to be able to head up closer to a Java uh, upwind. With swift work from the crew, the maneuver worked and Constitution was able to get upwind and deliver another broadside to Java. With their maneuvering significantly hampered, Java decided to attempt to board Constitution, but in the process carried away or destroyed their bowsprit and jaboom. Much of each mast rigging on a sailing ship like Java depends on the support coming from other masts, and as one section falls or collapses, it weakens the ability of the other masts to continue to support themselves. This vulnerability added to the capability of Constitution's ongoing fire to continue to take down sections of Java's mast, eventually rendering her completely unmaneuverable. First, the upper section of the mizzen gaff came down, then the upper section of the main mist, and eventually Java was unable to really maneuver at all. Believing that Java had struck their colors at this point, Constitution set more sail and shot ahead to take advantage of an opportunity to repair their own rigging, which had been badly cut up. But seeing that Java was still flying a flag, they came back around for another rake. It was at that point that Java surrendered, nearly three hours after the first broadsides had begun. At about 6 p.m. after Java had surrendered, Constitution sent across a lieutenant to take command of the ship and inspect the damage. On board, the scene was dismal to say the least. The ship was in a state of utter chaos and carnage. The falling masts had collapsed through the deck and there were at least a hundred men injured and estimates of the dead ranged from anywhere from 22 to over 50. The exact numbers are uncertain because the exact numbers of the crew on Java were uncertain at the time. It took Constitution about two days to actually get all of the surviving crew off of Java. And at that point, they realized that the ship was in too bad a shape to even take as a prize over the long journey that they would still have to get back to a friendly port, much less to Boston. So Java was scuttled on site, and Constitution began its long voyage back. It would take about six weeks for the ship to eventually get back to Boston, returning on February 15th. For William Bainbridge, the victory over Java was a huge vindication and a recovery of his career. Bainbridge had had a horrible reputation before taking command of Constitution. During the Quasi-War, he had been the first U.S. Uh, naval commander to surrender his ship to an enemy, and he became the second during the Barbary Conflict when he lost the USS Philadelphia to Tripoli, and was consequently uh, imprisoned by the Tripolitans. So for Bainbridge, this was a chance at redemption, and it definitely worked. The U.S. and the American public, uh, following first Guerriere and now Java, were excited beyond imagination at the U.S. Navy's new ability to defeat British ships. 
The second victory also helped secure the reputation for USS Constitution as uh, a warship that was winning for the U.S. Like the other battles Constitution was involved in in the War of 1812, it wasn't strategically pivotal in changing the course of the war, uh, but it was hugely important in changing the morale of the nation uh, toward the war and bolstering a sense of respect for both the Navy and in turn the nation. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to post them to any of our social media. And if you have suggestions for other videos you'd like to see in the future, don't hesitate to post those too. Thanks a lot.